Mark chapter 5 is where we'll be. I'll tell you the verse in a moment. Just go ahead and find Mark chapter 5. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. For those of you that are new to the Word, the second of the first four books of the New Testament, the second of the four Gospels, Mark chapter 5. More than likely written by a young follower of Jesus and a good friend and later a ministry partner of Peter. More than likely the words of Peter written and transcribed by Mark. More than likely the earliest of all the Gospels, which is important to what we're going to read today for a specific reason. And you will see this is going to tie right into it. I promise you. Just watch. Mark chapter 5. I want to set the context, so look at me for a moment, and then I'll tell you the verse. So, what we're going to see today is Jesus ministering along the shores of Lake Galilee, and I'll give you more context to that later. Huge crowd following. He will be diverted in the midst of his walk, and he doesn't mind, by a request. And in the middle of that diversion, another thing happens. This is, this is what we would call a, a sandwich narrative. That is, it starts with one thing. In the middle of it, that would be the meat. So he got a piece of bread <laughs> and then the meat. Something else happens, and then once that's taken care of, then the but the top piece of bread is put on. So you see two things happening at once with one sandwiched in the midst of them. The focus of what we're going to read is about two women, actually two females. One is a woman of adult age. We don't know, but we're, the scripture sure, surely implies that. The other one is a young lady. She's 12 years old. In the ancient Jewish culture at 13, the, the man and the, and the, or the, the girl and the boy that turned 13 is considered an adult for most part. So she's almost that. She's a young lady. Two women. You're also going to see something that might appear odd or as a clue. And if I didn't say this, you might even miss it. A lot of people miss it because there's, it's quite a lengthy narrative and it comes at different points in the narrative. But the number 12 will pop up twice. That's important. Two women, we'll call the young lady a woman. The number 12 attached to both of them. Jesus in the middle of it. Now there's a crowd. And there are personalities there, characters in this account. And we'll do some assuming, but it's biblical assuming after we go through this, uh, the text here. Two personalities who really stand out. And because there's a crowd, you've got to imagine that there's every kind of human emotion there. That would be in any crowd of people. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Two people with two different requests in real life, in a real time. Now, please hear me. Not that any of us who are under the blood and who've been in the word for a long time, and I'm not speaking down to anybody that that might not define who's here or watching or listening. I'm just saying, not that any of us who are under the blood need any kind of confirmation for anything about the word of God. We're way past that point in our lives now. We know it's real. We know it's confirmed. We know we can trust in it. We know we can believe. But just in case, and, and even for those of you that know the word, this is still something cool you can show people. In this account... There is the name of a man that's given, the place where he works, the city he works in, and then it describes all of this around that man, 
and the book of Mark was written during the time when all of the witnesses were still alive. That man was probably still alive. He probably still worked in the same place. And anybody could have checked it out. Everything that you're getting ready to read that happened. This is not a make-believe story. It's not something that's a lie or something that people added later. to the, Even if they did add it later, still people could check it out. It's, but this was written we have some of the most ancient manuscripts known to humans now because of the Qumran texts and the Dead Sea Scrolls. And, and we know that it was there. And it was written early, early, early after the church was born, which means the name is given by Mark. The place where the guy works is given. And we know the town. And all anybody had to do to check out this unbelievable story was to go ask him. I'm sure they did. And because this has survived for 2,000 years without any serious question at all, we can bank on it. What you're getting ready to see, it happened. Which speaks all the way up to us. Not only us, but our day. Not only us and our day, but this world. And how we as believers approach it. Yes, hopefully we will feel good when we leave here. But I hope more than that, we will become better in our walk with the Lord. Amen? Amen. Now what I want to do, with all of that background in mind, is just to read this portion. It's a little lengthy, but I'll take three, four minutes. But I mean, it's more than one or two verses. It's a little lengthy. I'm just going to read it. And then I'm going to come back and unwrap it even more and demonstrate some of it to you as well. Mark chapter 5, beginning with verse 21. I'll explain all the things that need to explain later. Verse 21, Mark chapter 5. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, that would be Galilee, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. And we know that this was right outside of Capernaum. His headquarters, Peter's house was there, verse 22. Then one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus, he came there. And seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet. And he pleaded earnestly with him. Jesus, my little daughter is dying Please come put your hands on her so that she'll be healed and that she won't die. So Jesus went with him. Now a large crowd followed and they pressed in around him. And a woman was there. She had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and she'd spent all she had. Dang, not much has changed, has it? Amen. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. You could say the hem of his garment. I'll explain that later. Because she thought, if I can just, if I can just touch his clothing, I'll be healed. So she touched. Immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothing? You see the people crowding around you, his disciples answered, and yet you ask who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, she came and fell at his feet. And trembling with fear, she told him the whole truth. He looked at her. He said, daughter, your 
faith has healed you. Go in peace. You're now free from your suffering. Now, while Jesus was still speaking to the crowds, some men came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler. So now we know his name, we know where he works, and we know his position, and we know the town he lives in. Your daughter is dead, they said. Don't even bother the teacher anymore. Ignoring what they said, he blocked, deleted, and ignored them. <laughs> Jesus told the synagogue ruler, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Just believe. At this point, Jesus did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And they came to the home of the synagogue ruler. That would be at Capernaum. Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and he said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child's not dead, she but sleeps. They laughed and mocked him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him, and they went into the room where the child was. He took her by hand and he said to her, Talitha kom which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up. She walked around. She was 12 years old. At this, the people were completely astonished. And he gave them strict orders not to let anyone know about this. And then he said to them what anybody who knows teenagers would say. <laughs> now give her something to eat. <laughs> All right, y'all, there, there it is. We know his name. We know where he worked. We know his position. Let's back up a little bit. It begins with he came back across the lake. And then he gets out. Now he's headed, as you'll read before and read after, he's headed from the beach docking area up to Capernaum. Some of you have been there. I have been there. My wife and I have been there. It's not far from the shores of Galilee, and it's a beautiful village, town. And this is the headquarters where Jesus is made. It's where Peter lives. It's where Jesus has already worked several miracles there, trying to do it quietly, but it got around quickly. Just something as simple as healing Peter's mother-in-law in that house. Early, early on in his ministry there. She was sick and then sick unto death. And he just walked in her room, took her by the hand, and said, be healed. She got up and started making dinner for everybody. One of the disciples leaked it to the press. <laughs> and it got out, and everywhere he went, crowds began to follow him. Other things happened there as well, and I, I want to focus on these two situations here, so I need to move on. But you can read the scriptures and find out everything that happened. But then what we discover is, after some time there, he gets in the boat with his disciples. They go to the other side of the lake. Really, it's kind of at an angle from Capernaum down to the southern end of the lake, but it is the other side because it's also a, a little west, south and west, into the area of the Decapolis. Decapolis in Latin means the place of ten cities. Largely a Roman and Gentile stronghold. A few Jews there. But it was a part of the Roman Empire. So they go across the lake with his disciples. Now they're going to the Gentiles with the good news. And the first place they land at is a cemetery on the shore. They come to shore at a place called Gadarene or Gadara. The Gadarenes live there. Jesus is immediately confronted 
by a couple of homeless people that lived among the tombs. There they would find shelter when they needed it. But they were absolutely, one account says one man, another account says two, so I'm just saying at least a couple, at least one, a couple. It was kind of a place where homeless folks lived. We find places now at big intersections and the interstate and stuff and where the woods are and they go. Same thing here. Except two, or at least one, maybe two, approached him and was absolutely demon-possessed. And you'll remember all of that. He drives them out. You actually, in that passage, hear the demons speak. And they know who Jesus is. And they're terrified. And they know that he can kill them. They have a request. He grants their request. That's another sermon. Bible's interesting, isn't it? So that's where they've been. And they're there for a while. Now they come back across the lake. And they come back right outside of Capernaum the headquarters, he gets out of the boat and crowds, they see him off. Some of the fishermen begin to shout as they see his boat coming. The disciples, they recognize it by now. With Peter in the midst, it's like a clown car in a circus coming. <laughs> they, they hear the shouts and the joke telling and the loud mouth and they see Jesus standing in the midst of it and they let everybody know. And before long, the village begins to empty out and come to the seashores because they had seen or heard from firsthand people, from some of their family members, perhaps. But they had seen and heard about all the things he did. He had even healed the little boy of a centurion, a Roman soldier in Capernaum. Now, you know, there were a lot of people who didn't like that, especially the Jews. But he did that. I mean, all of this, they knew this. So here's the crowd. Here's Jesus. He gets out. The disciples are getting out. Peter's running his mouth. Andrew's helping him. They're anchoring the boat off. Jesus is on the shore. People are flocking around him. He's already loving and speaking to them. Maybe touching and healing and praying over some. All of the disciples are with him. They're going to make their way up to Capernaum. More than likely, their initial destination, at least the disciples thought, Jesus being God in the flesh knew exactly what was going to happen. But he doesn't speak of it. He just says, let's, let's go. They head up the road, off the beach, up the road a little ways, as they would enter the town of Capernaum. Interesting. In Hebrew, Capernaum means the village of peace. Just like Jesus was born in Bethlehem, which means the house of bread. Now he makes his headquarters in the village of peace. None of this is on accident. On the way up to Capernaum, the crowds all pressed in around him. He's probably teaching. He's probably ministering to the crowd just with his voice of the kingdom message. Along the way, he's probably touching and praying with folks. Looking off in the distance a little bit, they see a little entourage. You can tell they're important by the way they're dressed. And if you had lived several thousand years ago in Capernaum and in that Jewish life in the midst of the Roman Empire, you would have recognized their dress to be that of important officials from the synagogue. Now, Jairus is going to come and speak to Jesus. The Bible identifies him as the ruler of the synagogue. And what we know from Jewish history and synagogue operations during that time there were a group of people, even the modern-day Christian church, some churches and even denominations have copied this from the Jewish synagogue. They had a board of elders in the Jewish synagogues. And the guy that was like the chairman of the elders, he was called the ruler. Or that's how it translates in English, but it basically means chairman. I don't know that they had that word, so 
it translates in English as to the ruler. And his responsibility was to direct those elders under him and he himself. And they would take care of all of the administrative affairs of the synagogue. It was a pretty orderly way and a constructive way to do worship and the business of the synagogue. But the ruler of the synagogue held a lot of power. A lot of people deferred to him. In fact, he even got to choose who brought the message each Sabbath day. Works a little different than the way we do it here. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> but, I mean, I'd be out of a job quickly. If <laughs> but, but that's how it worked. And, and, and do, do you remember I preached some weeks ago? There's a speaker there. I preached weeks ago. <laughs> it's big as an automobile. I don't know how... Weeks ago, I preached a message on the rich young ruler. Remember that? And that's what he was. He was young. He was wealthy. No telling. Maybe he'd gotten his position by his youth and his power, maybe family connections. But he was the ruler. He was the chairman of all the elders of his synagogue. You remember that? Okay. Well, here's Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue in Capernaum, the place where Jesus lives and has his headquarters at the house of Peter. So they identify that this is him, and these are some of the elders from the synagogue. Now, that whole town was very, very Hebrew, very, very Jewish, and so the people would <coughs> defer to them, and here they come. So he just envision this now. You know the whole background. You know how they got there. You know where they're going. You see the crowd. You can see Jesus, the disciples. Jesus every now and then having to turn to Peter saying, shut up, don't make me come back there. <laughs> don't make me stop this crowd. I just like to make it real. <laughs> this is life. And they look and here comes the board of elders from the synagogue. And Jairus is leading the way. Now, normally when Jesus sees something like that, it's going to be, they're going to come out and accuse him of some kind of blasphemy or some kind of false teaching, or they're going to question him more, try to embarrass him in front of the crowds. And usually a bunch of Pharisees are mixed in among them, kind of the keepers of the whole synagogue system throughout the land of Judea. And they report back to the Sanhedrin council back in Jerusalem, which is made up of Pharisees and Sadducees. So, so they see this crowd coming towards them out of Capernaum and it's led by the ruler of the synagogue. I don't know, but I'm sure Peter said, this can't be good. It seldom was good. They come literally running up. The crowd defers a little bit and parts the little ocean around Jesus because they know that they're coming for Jesus. And they want to be off in the wings to see what happens just in case they need to switch sides. I'm glad nobody has done that in the United States in the last couple of years. And so there's Jesus. Jairus is leading the way. The pack is around him. Jairus has got tears streaming down his cheeks. He gets right up to Jesus and he falls on his knees. And he grabs his legs. And he begins to weep into his clothing. And he looks up at him. Jesus, my little daughter, she's, she's sick. She's been sick for days and she's breathing her last. We can all tell. Even the doctors are there and they're all saying she will not last much longer at all. She is dying. She's near unto death right now. Please, please, could you break away? Could you come? Could you, could you lay a hand on her and heal her? This is the ruler of the synagogue. It's amazing what it sometimes takes to bring people to Jesus. And I don't judge people by how they came to Jesus. See, some of us were blessed to be raised in a Christian family, to go to church a lot, finally to hear the gospel message, the Holy Spirit moves in our life. We come to the Lord. Others of us were not so blessed. And so some of us have come to the Lord in very tough circumstances, even godless circumstances even circumstances of desperation. 
in a crisis of belief, a crisis in your family. I hate Jesus, I hate Jesus, I hate Jesus, I hate Jesus until my daughter's dying and he might heal her. My daughter, she's 12 years old, Lord. She's dying. She's my pride and joy. She is my precious one. She's my baby girl. Please come touch her and heal her. Don't let her die. Please. The people in the crowd were now silent. Jesus looks at him and he smiles and he says, Calm down. Don't fear about anything. Have faith. Let's go to your house, Jairus. And they begin to turn, and the crowd as one big wad, they don't want to miss this, they start heading for Capernaum. Jairus is now right up next to Jesus, I'm certain. Some of the rulers of the synagogue are right there with him. Some maybe got lost in the crowd, but they're headed to Capernaum. On the way. Jesus is now the ambulance. His lights and sirens are on. They're headed to the place of emergency. And he puts on the brakes. Don't you know Jairus is just a little bit upset. And Jesus says, stop. Everybody stop, 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 stop. Somebody has touched me and I felt power go out from me. The disciples, probably led by Big Mouth Peter, <laughs> said exactly what Big Mouth Carl would have probably said. <laughs> Somebody touched you. Have you looked around? <laughs> Hundreds of people have been clawing you. And now you stop the ambulance and turn the lights and sirens off and you say, Somebody touch me? Do you get the scene? Put yourself in Jairus' place right now. Good. Lord, did I not tell you? She's next to death. If you don't get there, she'll die. Does this, does this remind you of anything? Three years later into his history, right before he goes to the cross, he's down by the Jordan and he gets a message from Mary and Martha up in Bethany. Lazarus, our brother, the man you love, he's right up next to death. Please come if you'll touch him and heal him. And the Bible says Jesus delayed four more days. <laughs> he stopped the ambulance. Well, we know the rest of that story. This is very reminiscent of it. It, 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 is, it is something that happens very similar early on. So now the crowd is pressing in. Somebody touch me and I felt power go out of me. Now this is important because we read in the scriptures, we know who touched him. And we know why. She had an issue of blood that had lasted 12 years. Now let me tell you why this is so important. There are several different medical conditions that could happen particularly to a female that could cause this, and all of them were miserable, some of them were pure, nasty, some of them would lead to death. The Bible didn't say which one, it doesn't matter. She had a sickness that had not been healed for a dozen years, and in Jewish law, if you had that sickness, you were declared unclean like a leper. You could not be touched, you could not be employed. If you were employed, you were under a mandate that you couldn't be employed. You had a disease. And so now she was homeless and a beggar and probably mocked and despised, probably mercilessly by children made fun of 
people would walk by. They would cry and point at her and cry out, unclean, she's unclean. Maybe she was required because it was against the law, the Jewish law, for her to touch others or for, or for others to touch her. So she probably, like the leprosy law, was required to cry out if somebody got too close, unclean, unclean. How humiliating. Unvaxxed, unvaxxed. <laughs> I just, I said I wasn't going to say it. Okay, I lied. I lied. But that, I, I'm just trying to help you to see, and you'll see even more in a minute, not much has changed. And the reactions of people. And Jesus in the midst. Now, oh, hang on. So this is her. We know who it was that touched him. But watch. It says she was thinking to herself, if I could just touch the, the hem of his garment touch his clothing. Why would she think that? Because there is a Jewish superstition that was heavy then and still exists today that the rabbis, the ones that the people consider to be very holy, that if you could just touch the hem of their cloaks, their garments, their prayer shawl or something and just kind of use it as like a, a rosary bead, just kind of rub it and, and, and because because you touched his clothing, his clothing is holy because he's a holy man and so he would be healed or you could be healed. Maybe, maybe not, but you, there's a possibility. It's like you go to the, you could take your drugs, you take your, you do what you're supposed to do and then, oh, there's a holy rabbi and you run up to him and, and you grab and most of the time the rabbis would say, my dear child, and put his hand and then bless. Now, in case you're thinking, well, you know, that's just the custom. Would you feel a little bit odd if people came running up to me after each service and grabbing the hems of my clothing. I hope your jacket heals me this morning. Take a whiff of it. You probably will not think that. Yeah, you know, I mean, I'm not trying to make too much fun of all of this. It's just people, they cling. They're desperate when they're hurting, when they're, when they're sick, when they're about near death, when they're outcast, when they're mocked, when they're ridiculed, when they're unclean. And so in that culture, there was a little outlet for that, a little superstitious outlet. But Jesus didn't say, stop, somebody touched the hem of my garment. And power went out from that garment, and maybe they're going to get healed now. Uh-uh. Somebody touched me, and power went out of me. The only way power goes out to somebody like that from the throne of Jesus Christ is because they're touching his throne in faith and humility. Sometimes desperation. Sometimes it's the last resort for them. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to me as a pastor. It certainly doesn't matter to Jesus who wants all to come to him if they will. That's why he says, stop Stop the ambulance. Turn off the lights and sirens. That's why Jairus, or Jairus was going, my daughter. And then Jesus says, somebody touch me. And the disciples say, do you see what we see? Why would you ask such a question? Of course somebody touched you. I mean, they're, they're seriously concerned. But while he says those words, the Bible says that the woman knowing He's talking about her. Because many had touched him. Watch. But only one had touched in the midst of their desperation in heartfelt, soul-deep faith. Only one. And that's the one to whom his power went. Are you following me? That's why she knew. He was talking about her because of the moment she touched him, her bleeding stopped. She could feel it. Can you imagine 12 years having a disease that you could feel? That it would soil your clothing, your body. The pain would cause you to writhe. You had to sit all day long begging for enough pennies to buy a little morsel to eat. Yeah, it was real faith. 
Yeah, it was real power that went out from Jesus. Yes, he knew. I guarantee he knew who it was. But she still had one more step of her faith. She needed to come confess it with her mouth. She needed to be unashamed in the crowd. She began correctly. Now Jesus is challenging her. Finish well. Finish correctly. Power has gone out from me. Somebody has touched me. The woman. Now she gets up. It was me. The crowd parts. They know who she is. She's unclean. Oh my gosh. Stay away from me. How come you didn't cry out unclean? You've broken the law. She's wading through the crowd. She comes up to him. Now she falls on her knees. She grabs him. She begins to weep. She calls him Lord. Lord, give us me. And then the Bible says she told him everything. He puts his hand on her and he says, Daughter, now you're healed. Now you can go in faith. Basically, he said, here's your life back. You can get your job back. You can get your family back. You can get your dignity back. You can get your freedom back. Your faith. To the bone, to the soul faith, it has healed you. You are not double-minded. You are not ashamed. You knelt before me in front of a crowd. So I declare you, from the throne of God, you are healed. You know, think about it. According to Jewish law, she was an outcast. She was filth. She was unclean. She was separated from life. A few minutes later, she was part of a crowd. A few minutes later, she was a person of faith reaching out. A few minutes later, she was called by the king of kings. You are my daughter now. You're not just one in a crowd. You're not just someone sitting up against a wall as a beggar. You're not unclean. Now I call you my daughter. She went from just a nobody to a daughter of the creator of the universe. Amen. Now there's another daughter waiting. Jerry has probably looked at Jesus, might have, I'm sure he was moved by it, but what's moving him most is his daughter is dying. And just as all of this is happening, here comes another entourage. Jairus, Jairus, your daughter has died. You can tell that teacher just to forget about it. I don't know what Jairus' reaction was. If it was me, I'd have fallen into the dirt. I'd probably passed out. Nobody wants to hear that. And especially when there was a chance that this miracle worker who had touched people and healed them from death and disease, that he could have done that for his daughter, but yet he Instead, he stopped for an unclean beggar. Jesus looked at Jairus and he said, Have faith. What, what did you just see, Jairus? What did you just see? Have faith. The implication is have faith like her. Isn't it amazing that woman, anybody who touched her became unclean. Anybody she touched became unclean. She touched Jesus. He didn't become unclean. He cleaned her up. Amen. Do you get it? That's why I say it's implied that Jesus is saying to him now, have faith like her. Now let's go to your house. 
He takes Peter, James, and John. He tells the other disciples, stay here and manage this crowd. He tells the crowd, please forgive us. This is personal. His little daughter has died. This is not something to go gawk at. Do you understand? And I think they understood. And they stayed. Peter, James, John. Now head to the house in Capernaum of the ruler of the synagogue. Before they even get there, the Bible says they could hear the weeping and the wailing. Some of them were sincere people who were brokenhearted for that family. But because he was a dignitary in the town, it was not uncommon for people to show up in those situations and weep and wail just to exalt themselves in the eyes of the dignitaries. In fact, there was even a service provided wherein you could pay somebody and they would bring crisis actors in. <laughs> oh, no, this is a Hebrew custom. You find it in all the scholarly writing. Not everybody there was a crisis actor, but there were some who were paid. And you know what? The Bible gives us a hint of their insincerity. Because when Jesus walked in, he says, she is not dead, she but sleeps. Now, any of the Hebrews there would know that that word is a euphemism for dying, but she's not ceasing to exist. It's the same thing Jesus would later tell Mary and Martha and his disciples. He said, come, let's go to Bethany now. Well, he's dead by now. He's not dead, he's just sleeping. What's Jesus going to do? He's going to bring him back to life. He says the same thing here. And the people in the house, they're, ah, they're weeping, they're wailing, they're weeping. And here's the miracle worker. He said, she's not dead, she's just asleep. They should have gone, praise God, praise God. He's going to rectify this. Instead, they mocked and they laughed. How, if you were Jer Jairus and his wife, how would you feel about that? The Bible doesn't say this, but it implies it. Because when he does raise the little girl, there's nobody. He just says, no, don't, don't tell anybody. But there was a house full. So it implies that when they mocked him, he probably turned to them and said, everybody out. All of you doubters, you will not be allowed to see what's getting ready to happen. Out now. Then they're in the house alone. They walk to the bed. The mother is still weeping. She's laying over the body of her child. Her 12-year-old daughter is dead. The daddy kneels beside the bed. The mother and daddy join hands across the body of their daughter. Jesus, Peter, James, and John. four of them. They stand. They had come with the dead. I can see them standing in the room, kind of around the dead. Maybe one goes over and puts his hand on the shoulder of the mom. Jesus is just standing there. He's looking at the little girl. They're weeping. She's 12 years old. Talitha Kum. her shoulder. The parents said, she just moved. Talitha. Come on. She groans. She moves her head. She opens her eyes. The mother practically faints into the bed. The dad begins to weep uncontrollably. Peter looks at the disciples and he goes, He's done it again. The little girl sits up. She takes a breath. She smiles. And she just looks around the room. There's no telling what she saw when she left this physical existence.
but now she knows where she is. Jesus looks at her and smiles. She smiles back. And then Jesus says, what you say to a teenager, get her something to eat. And then he looks at the parents and says, do not put this on Facebook. Do not make a YouTube video. Do not tweet this. It's not time to do that yet. The number 12 is very important in the Word of God. 187 times the number 12 is found from Genesis to Revelation. Some prominent examples. There were 12 tribes of Israel that came from the 12 sons of Jacob. The 12 tribes that settled the land and became the nation of Israel, the nation of promise, the nation through which the word of God would come, the prophecies of God would come, the prophecies of Messiah would come, the nation through which Messiah would come, the nation through which the church would be born and the Holy Spirit would be given first. 12. 12 tribes. When Jesus begins his earthly ministry, he picks how many disciples? 12. We go on and on through the scripture, even when we get in the book of Revelation. We hear about the 144,000 that are sealed, 12 times 12,000. When we get into the last chapters and we hear about the new heaven, we see the new heaven and the new earth, and the throne of God and the tree of life and the, the leaves and the fruit. There are 12 different kinds of fruit for the healing of the nations. I could go on and on. The scripture speaks of 12 legions of angels that are at the call and beck and call of the Lord God. Millions upon millions upon hundreds of millions, 12 legions. The number 12, how many months in a year that the Lord has said? 12. Even the earth's orbit around the sun is measured by 12. 12 is the number that speaks of the perfection of God's administration of order and the perfection of God's revelation to those of faith. 12. It's a huge number. It's no accident. The Jairus' daughter was 12 years old when she died and was brought back to life. It's no accident this woman had been sick to the point she might as well be dead for 12 years and then brought back to life. All of this was intended as a revelation, a perfect holy revelation. Jesus didn't raise all the dead in Israel. He didn't heal all the sick. But on this day, at this time, two different people sandwiched in in one account. We read of it all and we discover they're both marked by the number 12. This was for them. This was for us. You know what the main features that's, that was a part of the demonic and the satanic that day? Watch this. Disease. Sickness, death, fear, the loss of livelihood. I'm so glad that doesn't mark our world today. Disease, sickness, death, fear, the loss of jobs, mocking, unclean. You're one of those unclean Bible believers, aren't you? You got some faith in Jesus. You're just one of those Bible thumpers. You, you belong to that Christian cult. You are unclean to the rest of us. And we want to invoke fear in your heart so that you'll quit living for your faith. Do you see it? The word of God is living and it is sharper and active than any two-edged sword. It pierces to both the heart, the bone, and the marrow. 
Was your heart pierced this morning by the word? Does it help you to understand as we walk through those doors? We might have come here to feel a little better, and perhaps we have. But we've also come here to walk out of those doors and to be better. Like Jairus was challenged and like this woman was challenged. To be better. To walk in faith, not to be double-minded. To keep your eyes on Jesus. And to understand this life is not about perfection. Neither of those were perfect, but it's about direction. Both of them knew to go to Jesus. And both of them in faith said, our faith is in you. We're at the end of our line. God's still moving and working. The power of Jesus Christ is still among us. You say, well, I know somebody, a friend of mine or a family member of mine, they were sick and they died. Well, but, but we live in a fallen world. We live in a world filled with disease and death. Jesus has not promised us in this life that, we, that we're going to live in this flesh forever. Something, if the, if the Lord's return doesn't happen in our lifetime, something's going to take us out. Something, a disease, a pestilence, a plague, an epidemic, an accident. Uh, uh, some crime against us, something's going to take us out. Or we could be the one to hear, <laughs> and in a twinkling, in a flash of the eye, <sighs> we are with the Lord. It could be. It could be. Give the Lord a hand. You know, let me just ask you there are times when something when something is said or sung, you know, I see people, should I clamp? If everybody else will help me. Do you have to have permission at a football game? Some of y'all act like fools at a football game. And everybody celebrates with you and they love it. I mean, we come here, if the word of God excites you, just shout, amen. You can stand up, clap if you want. Wouldn't you do that at a football game? Right? Why is it when we come to church, we go, I don't know. If they'll do it, I'll do it. <laughs> I'm just having fun with you. I'm just telling you. You got freedom here to shout for joy, to give the Lord a hand, to bless his name, and to be excited about what God is doing. The Lord just scored a touchdown this morning. Okay? So give him a hand. Amen. Fear, death, disease, pestilence, epidemic, threats, mocking, job loss. Those are all the tools of Satan. But God has not given us that demon of fear. He's given us a, a spirit, the Holy Spirit of power and love and of a sound mind so that we can walk through this world and then we can decide for ourselves how to take care of ourselves as we continue to walk as children, daughters and sons of God. And Satan's going to throw all the sickness and disease and death and fear at us. He can. But the bottom line is every day we have to get up and decide, am I going to live for Satan or am I going to live for Jesus? As for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. How about you? guys. Give the Lord a hand of praise. Amen. Amen. Now, you know, he still moves and walks among us. This is not some children's bedtime story. It's an account of something that happened that changed those people and that crowd and that town and changed the whole framework. I mean, it infuriated the world and the religious elite until they dragged everything they could out to get Jesus on a cross and be done with him, they thought. Boy, were they in a surprise 2,000 years later. Woo! <laughs> the bottom line is we have to choose. Are we going to walk? Are we going to walk in this world trying to be friends with it when it hates us? Or are we going to walk in this world understanding we are in this world, but we are not of this world. We belong to Jesus. We are ambassadors for the soon coming King of Kings. We belong to him. Can he heal us in the midst of us being attacked? Of course he can. And many times he does. And if he doesn't, he understands and knows why. And when you park through those curtains to the next realm, you'll understand why. And you'll praise him for it. It's as simple. Those are the blessing and promise of God's word. So let's not get caught up in the temptation of blaming God for every ugly thing that happens to us. Blame the one that brings every ugly thing. Right. Speak, Satan, this is why I hate you more. This is why I hate your filth more. And I continue now to plead the blood of Jesus in the name of Jesus. And like Job cried out, even though God slays me, yet 
will I still serve him? Amen. Amen. Pray with me. So, Father, I pray for those that are here this morning that have never surrendered their life to Jesus Christ. I pray for the return of prodigals. I pray for healing by the name of Jesus. I pray for deliverance this morning in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. Pray for insight, wisdom. And I ask it in Jesus' name. We sing these words. We love these words. We love this song. I know I do. The title of the song is, he is, is He Worthy? The words are written by Andrew Peterson. I want to read the verses and then I'll end with a chorus. Do you feel the world is broken? Do you feel the shadows deepen? But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? Do you wish that you could see it all made new? We do. Is all creation groaning? But is a new creation coming? Is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? And is it good that we remind ourselves of this? It is. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? Ah, it's the Lion of Judah. He's conquered the grave. He's David's root and the lamb who died to ransom the slave. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy of this for me? He is. Does the Father truly love us? Does the Spirit move among us? And does Jesus, our Messiah, hold forever those he loves? And does our God intend to dwell again with us? He does. And I will say it again, is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? It's the Lion of Judah who conquered the grave. He's David's root and the lamb who died to ransom the slave from every people and tribe, every nation and tongue. He has made us a kingdom and priests to God to reign with his son. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy of all of this? Is he worthy? stand.